they're complex systems like human beings that can only be understood at higher levels in which science starts to fade out and things like um, literature, the arts, cooking start to come to the fore and become much more important than knowing the chemistry of something. So those are the pitfalls that I don't want you to, you to fall into and I don't want to fall into, reductionism and scientism. But yet, the important thing about naturalism is that we do stick with science as our way of knowing about what what ultimately exists, the furniture of the universe, as scientists like to call it, and philosophers of science. The basic conclusion of naturalism is that we are, ourselves, fully natural creatures. We're fully physical, fully material, <coughs> that our constituents are those that science describes in its various theories, whether it's cosmology, we are stardust after all, a wonderful big story of how we got to be here is what science tells us. We are also evolved creatures, Darwin Day coming up on the 12th. That's the big earthbound story of how we got to be the creatures that we are. But all of this is fully physical. There's nothing supernatural about it. And that's a marvelous fact. It's a fact to be celebrated that we don't have to appeal to anything supernatural to understand ourselves and to see what remarkable creatures we are. There's a tradition of philosophical naturalism that some of you probably know about that starts when? Probably around the turn of the uh, 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century. People responding to the transcendentalists like Emerson said, mm -mm, we can do better than that. We can have a science-based philosophy of naturalism which is adequate to our lives. We don't have to appeal to the supernatural. So you had people like John Dewey, James Woodbridge, uh, Santayana, and a little bit more recently, Sidney Hook, a famous uh, American naturalist. And again, I mean this naturalist as opposed to supernaturalist. And more, uh, even more recently in the current era, we have uh, Paul Kurtz, the Center for Inquiry, who's a, a stout naturalist in this scientific philosophical sense. Wonderful fellow. But what I want to do is, is extend naturalism uh, using this tradition as a background and say that Naturalism not only questions the existence of God, it also challenges the common sense notion of the soul. Or, on, in a more secular sense, of the mental agent that some people might feel is sitting inside their head looking out at the world. The brain is a physical organ and it creates this wonderful, rather subtle and mysterious sense of self that some people, many people, in fact, most construe as something immaterial. But guess what? Science says, the naturalistic view of ourselves says, no, we're not of two natures. The brain it does it all. <coughs> we don't have souls. And this is contrasted, of course, with the, the soul-based view of the world, which most people hold. Now, we're in, in this room, we're in the cutting edge in denying the existence of the supernatural up there. But to push the cutting edge a bit, what I want to suggest is that we have to keep going with our naturalism and question the existence of anything immaterial here. So what's important about this is that there are two views of human agency that are connected with views of human nature. The soul-based view says that human beings have a special kind of freedom. And again, many of you out there won't subscribe to what I'm about to say, which is fine, but m most people believe the following, or many do that since we have souls, we have a special kind of freedom or free will. A kind of freedom that allows us to act in a way that whatever the circumstances were, we could have done something other than what we actually did. The soul, by virtue of being immaterial, and by its supernatural essence, has the capacity to act and to cause things itself, but is not itself fully caused. It's not fully determined by circumstances that surround it. Why? Because it's immaterial. By being immaterial, it's not at the effect of the body. It rides herd on the brain, some might think. Now, that's what I'm denying. That's what naturalists, if they're thoroughgoing naturalists, will deny. They'll deny that we have a soul, and we'll all, they'll also deny that we have this <coughs> capacity to cause without being caused ourselves. Now, I do things. I lift lift this up and I put it down, I freely chose to do that and that no one told me what to do. But, but that choice to do it, naturalists would say, is a fully caused, fully determined choice. 
On the other hand, if you were a soul-based person, you believe that you have this immaterial part of yourself, you would say that this, this decision to pick up and put this down was something that even if every single physical thing had been the same at that moment, I could have done something different. I could have done otherwise in the exact same situation. So here's the nub of the two views of agency. One view, the naturalist view, says, given that situation, that's the only behavior that could have arisen at that time because behavior is fully caused. Human beings, their brains, their behavior, everything about them is fully caused by their situation that they're currently involved in and their past circumstances, genetics and environment. The culmination of all this at this moment produces the behavior that you're seeing here. And it's producing the behavior that's going on in each and every one of your cells at, at this very moment. On the other hand, the other view of agency says no. Even if every single physical thing was the same, there's something non-physical that has the causally privileged power to intervene and do something other than what it did at that moment. So I hope, does this seem clear? These two different views of, of what, what kind of agents we are, what kind of, what kind of freedom we have. <coughs> So what I'm going to say is I'm going to call the second type of freedom, the soul-based freedom, contra-causal free will. That is, a kind of free will that can operate against or outside of causation. Contra-causal free will. I'm denying that we have that. I'm not denying that we have other kinds of freedom, very important kinds of freedom. Political freedom, the freedom to act voluntarily as we normally do, doing what we want to do. We're very lucky here in this culture to be gathering here voluntarily. This is a, an important, vital kind of freedom. And I would argue, and other people have argued, it's really the only kind of freedom we need. We don't need this other metaphysical, soul-based freedom that many people suppose we have. Free will is usually thought of as being things being up to me. I do something out of my free will just in case no one else is telling me what to do. When you sign a marriage license, they'll ask you, did you sign this of your own free will? And if the father is not there with a the shotgun, you'll say, yeah, yeah, I signed it of my own free will. That is, and it's, it's, it's obvious what this means. This is not metaphysical freedom. It's the freedom from being coerced, right? So there's an ordinary language use of the word free will that's quite acceptable to me and any other naturalists. We don't require a uh, soul-based contra-causal free will to sign something saying that I did something of my own free will. <coughs> now, some people like to suppose that if things were random, and as opposed to being caused and determined, that would give them a kind of freedom that's important, a kind of free will in this contra-causal sense. And I would deny that as well. So the, the truth of determinism as a philosophical thesis is not what I'm arguing for. Determinism could be false, and it still wouldn't be the case that we have this special kind of freedom. It, because if things are caused, then I as an agent am fully caused to do what I do. And we understand that from a scientific perspective. And there's actually no reason to think that we aren't fully caused. There might be quantum effects going on at the submolecular level, subatomic level, but those it's pretty much generally conceded wash out at the macro level of human behavior. So for all practical purposes, it's safe to, to assume, and the case is pretty much closed on this, there's a, a good deal of consensus in the philosophical and scientific community. community. It's safe to, to assume that we are determined creatures. Now, to the extent that there's something indeterministic going on in us, let's assume that's the case. Let's say determinism is false. There's an, a random element either in how I was made or in what I'm doing right now. Now, if there's a random element in that, I can't take credit for it. Because that element, obviously, if it's random, has nothing to do with my character. It has nothing to do with my intentions. It happens just at random, a cosmic ray shooting down and making, making me twitch. Suppose that happens. Could, could, could I take credit or blame for that act? No. So that sort of randomness doesn't rescue the idea of this strong sort of causally privileged freedom that most people, many people think is necessary. And what I want to reassure you is that this sort of freedom isn't necessary for anything that we hold near and dear to ourselves.